Uh, всем привет, uh, all together, and I'm very happy to, to be here, and I'm really looking forward to a, a live coding and live uh, productivity hacking, I think, uh, session. And yeah, I think that's a, that's a topic that's quite interesting, what that most uh, developers don't think about uh, most of the time. So yes, please ask uh, many questions, um, as many as possible, so then we have more uh, interaction also uh, with our expert, and I think that makes it a little bit more fun. And other than that, we will have some some tips and tricks. So I would say let's get started, right? So these are usually I'm not a big fan of slides, but I have just well one slide. Uh, a mini as a wood Sebastian, and I do things with uh, with Java as you can see here. And then I basically just want to uh, point out some tips and tricks that will, when followed, will make you more productive, especially as a Java developer. And let's start right away. Please don't forget to um, ask questions. So the first thing uh, that I want uh, to, to tell you as in order to be more productive as a developer is we should maximize the time that we spend on the keyboard. So you probably have heard of that and might or might not agree, right? Why is this uh, important? Because, well, as a developer, we, we type a lot usually, right? We want to um, type code. And there are many, many uh, things that make you more productive when you are on the keyboard, mostly when you uh, use touch typing. That is, you don't have to look at your keyboard, you just type. And um, you also don't have to have these context switches, these small uh, switches of your hand positions, which we're moving from the keyboard uh, to the mouse and back. So ideally, that means you use a lot of keyboard shortcuts, you, um, you know, maximize the time that you spent there. And uh, ultimately, this also means, and this is a, a topic that I think is uh, quite interesting, to get a proper keyboard. So um, I don't want to do some advertising for keyboard uh, brands here, but uh, basically um, that is what I'm using right now. Um, this actually has changed in the past. So uh, in general, I would uh, advise you to get a proper mechanical keyboard or proper well, um, well crafted keyboard. So this one is what I just using since a few weeks. So I've tried uh, uh, this, uh, this out and I really like it. Um, you can ask questions about like specific uh, brands that you have. Before this, I was using, there's also um, another brand uh, called uh, Das Keyboard. Um, sounds like a German article, but it's actually an American brand, which is uh, very well uh, crafted as well. Or Topper Keyboards um, as well. So they are um, also very nicely uh, produced, um, I would say. And I was using them before. So with these switches, um, I had one of these. And but right now I'm using that one and um, I'm quite happy with it. But in general, I think it just makes sense to, well, get a proper device. Why? Because we end up spending a lot of time on the keyboard and that, you know, will just make you enjoy the typing experience more, especially if you type a lot. Now, a little bit more uh, for the topic. Yeah. Uh, do you have a numpad? Actually, I don't. So with this keyboard, that's a very good question. With this keyboard, there is no numpad. And actually, I would say that's a uh, that's a benefit. That's an advantage. Why? Because if you have a numpad like uh, on this one, then what you do, well, actually, you don't on this one, um, like, uh, like on this one, you have to switch your hand positions, right? So if usually, um, you um, uh, you spend the time on the home row, right? Like F and J, and then you have to switch over there. If it's not like tactically feelable, then you have to look into it, like how to switch and switch back. And if you use uh, something like you type your key, you, you type the digits on the top row of your keyboard, uh, like you can see in, uh, in the picture, or actually what this keyboard enables, it has some extra modifier keys. So that means um, with the modifier, maybe you can see it on the website, a key, you can then press the special keys like cursor or home row or insert. You sometimes need that for IntelliJ, right? Um, without switching your hand position. And actually, I think that's a benefit. So I, I usually don't care about the uh, both the, um, the num lock, uh, the, the num block, uh, or the extra special section where you have, you know, home and delete and all this. So a very good question. I actually personally prefer these for the sake that you don't have to switch the hand position from your home row. Uh, very good question. Please continue to ask, uh, ask questions. Uh, but now I'm uh, slightly shifting the topic to the IDE. And I want to show just some, you know, tips and tricks how to basically leverage the IDE's power that we have. And um, 
This is the IDE that I typically use. This is uh, IntelliJ. Um, well, I'm just a very, very big fan of, uh, of the IntelliJ IDE um, because of multiple reasons. It really allows a nice um, usage of, um, of all of the features, especially when coding Java or something else. So um, what I now just create, well, actually, if you think of it, what I just did was already some type of shortcut or automation, right? I created a class and for me, it wrote public class main, right? I did not have to write this myself. Um, or for example, if I say, um, I write something like public static void main, right? Instead of typing this myself. And this is uh, called live templates in IntelliJ. And you are probably using uh, some of these already. So instead of saying, well, system out print line, you can just uh, hit a shortcut or type the live template, uh, hit a tab, and then it will expand it for you. And uh, also what I now want to show you um, is just to leverage these features a little bit more. So if I say, uh, if I do something like do this, do that, do something else, uh, then what I can do is just to say, well, for example, I want to uh, now refactor these methods to a different um, uh, to a different method. So what I could do, of course, I could write another private static void, do this and that, right? And then if I don't forget it, I can, um, and if I make it correctly, I can copy and paste this code here and don't forget to invoke the method over there and so on and so forth. And then you kind of refactor this. But of course, there's also an IDE feature for it. So instead of doing this manually, what we should do is to leverage the power that we have in the IDE, for example, the refactoring features. Uh, so let's make this back. What I can do, I can select these lines and say, well, actually uh, right click and then refactor, extract, extract method and say, okay, extract method, do this and that. And this is actually more reliable because then we won't forget to invoke the method or we won't you know, copy and paste uh, the wrong lines uh, um, accidentally and things like that. And once you've done that many, many times, then you're just tired of you know, right click, refactor, extract method, and you know this, okay, actually you can also hit a shortcut like control alt M and then say, do this and that. And then, uh, you know, another shortcut for uh, this method do something else. If you saw it, IntelliJ also already suggested a name and now it's really smart IDE. It will also say, well, if you change the method call that you, you can save some lines of codes. Okay, whatever, replace, yes, uh, replace all. And then, you know, we, we saved and refactored our code ve very quickly and uh, just, you know, very reliably. So this is just one of you know many many examples where your ide can just help you with the ide features which are safer uh, when programming than doing these things yourself Sebastian, uh, yes. a single question uh what white uh -huh. weights worth creating uh, because is it a single tone pattern or what um, um what uh, say it again. One is a. Um, is I didn't it worth to what, create what? Like a for a single tone pattern or for uh, other patterns in Gango Four yeah. book, or how to use life templates? Yes. So um, with the uh, with the patterns that is uh, available, well, it, it depends which one uh, you would uh, you would need, right? So um, for example, there are some. I would say for the most common pattern while coding. There is a, a refactoring um, block here. So, for example, we have something like extract a delegate, or when uh, when having a, a super class, you can even change like change inter inheritance by delegation, which uh, um, changes all of the code that resides in the super class to delegation and things like that. I don't know if there is like something uh, created for a single uh, a pattern. Um, I think there is a. Um, uh, there is a, a generate code for singleton pattern. So basically for the, if you do the old instance and uh, Java only like plain Java one, uh, there is something like that. But is there a more concrete question? Uh, otherwise, I'm not sure if I got the question right. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's go. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, and basically what I just showed there, uh, whatever you do, there's probably an IDE shortcut for that. So instead of, um, performing things, you know, manually and switching what I said before about the keyboard, switching between the mouse and the keyboard is doing things manually, right? Like what I just did, for example, if you say, okay, right click and then uh, refactor, um, you know, extract and so on and so forth. Instead of doing that, you can actually see that there is a shortcut for almost 
any action. Especially what I really like about IntelliJ, IntelliJ, it has a very well thought out keyboard concept. So even if you man if you navigate through the menus, if you say uh, I don't know, like run menu for example, and then say okay, you know, like go through these, and then you will see a very common pattern that it's usually Alt plus something and so on and so forth. And it it really makes sense once you get used to it. Um, to just navigate without even touching your mouse. So usually when I'm coding in IntelliJ, I'm not touching my mouse even uh, even once. Like that is, uh, that just makes it um, much more uh, efficient, I believe. Uh, in the chat, and, uh, in the chat, uh, yep. pe people ask, what do you think about Vim extensions for an IDE? For example, Vim wrapper for <laughs> Eclipse, etc. Yes, that's a very good question because you probably saw it already. I'm using a Vim emulation here. This is why my cursor looks uh, so weird, why it's, it's so big and not looks, it looks like this when I'm now in the insert mode in, in Vim. Yes, I use a Vim emulation in uh, in IntelliJ, and I have to say it's really, really getting better and better. I was struggling a little bit in the past because if you, for example, if you say search for a class here, and then you know if uh, if you search for a class, then you don't have the Vim um, syntax available, right? Because if I hit escape, then the menu is gone again. So um, it doesn't work with all of the um, all of the actions. Uh, but the more, um, I would say the more advanced the plugin is, the more people thought of, okay, in which context does it make sense to enable Vim mode or not? Uh, I would say the better. And uh, in, um, in IntelliJ, this works uh, really well. For example, in the configuration of uh, the Vim plugin, you can specify in which mode you want to be. So for example, when I uh, rename this method, then I usually stay in the same mode that I've been before. And I can move around still with the Vim uh, setting here, which really makes sense. If I say, okay, jump to the second T and then rename uh, this to just do this. Um, and then it's quick and I don't have to switch uh, back. So for me, um, because we will co cover this topic later as well, but I'm a big Vim fan. Um, it works really well for IntelliJ. Uh, especially with the other IDEs, I know there are Vim emulations for all of them, and for me, this is a big uh, benefit. But I, I don't know how well um, thought out all of the you know actions in every single menu is in uh, Eclipse and in NetBeans. All right, and then um, another very important uh, part is live templates of well any IDE that you use. So I already showed this with. Um, the, uh, you know, like system out, this is a live template. And this is why I can very quickly just type this code. But it's very important to also define live templates yourself, because there are only so many for what, you know, like every Java developer needs, like, for example, system out or main, right. But especially if you use any framework, if you use spring, if you use uh, Jakarta EE, if you use well, any other technology, then you will come up with code patterns you t keep typing all over again. And this even um, is true for very small patterns. So for example, if I say I want to type at inject, right? So typically what I do, I have to type, let's make this again, at inject, and then I have to select the correct import, right? And only this selection always costs a little bit of mental energy because I have to either go back to the cursor keys and says, okay, uh, select the correct one or uh, accidentally you choose the wrong um, import if there are multiple ones like singleton. And then, well, this is just faster if I say uh, I can inject some bean if I don't type at inject and select the import. But if I just say, well, I type a live temp uh, template like IJT, and this is one I defined, um, because I use this a lot, and that's just much faster. Uh, the same is true if you have something like, you know, a post construct method, um, or a pre destroy method, or uh, many times in uh, Java E, I had to type um, at persistent context, entity manager, entity manager, and you see it for all of these things, you can uh, just define um, your templates much, much easier. Uh, same with testing, if I say, okay, please create a test method, um, or void um, after each void before uh, for J unit. And you know, whatever you keep using, you should define a live template for it. And um, these are just some examples that I constantly use, but you will come up with different ones, depending on the frameworks and technology you use. And especially in IntelliJ, this is very powerful. So this is really uh, what I like. But also, this is not only true for Java. So for example, if I say I want to, um, for example, have some uh, 
configuration or some YAML. So if you use things like Docker Compose or Kubernetes, then you would end up uh, writing things like a Kubernetes deployment um, a specification. And this might be actually quite cumbersome to I make it smaller because it doesn't even fit on the screen uh, to create something like a deployment YAML scenario for Kubernetes. And if you would remember all of these things out of your head, because uh, there is no YAML schema here, well, it's quite cumbersome. You would have to look into the documentation and it's much, much faster to say, I create a template for it with the typical uh, scenarios being set here and, and what I need. Um, so that also makes sense uh, besides the usual Java code or Kotlin code or whatever you write in to define something for uh, configuration as well. All right, do we have some more uh, questions on the uh, IDE for now, uh, Aljek? Otherwise, I would uh, continue with well, let's the next continue, interesting. Yeah. Okay, perfect. The next interesting topic, what I also really like, use the command line, um, especially uh, the Linux command line if you're uh, on a Unix-based system. So this is what I, uh, what I have here. This is a command line um, here. And I have to say, I use the command line for now for almost everything that I do when I use the computer. So I don't even use a file explorer um, anymore. I just, you know, use the command line with the movement commands or, you know, like copying a file uh, and things like that. And once you, you know, get used to this, it's actually much faster because you can stay on the keyboard and just, you know, typing your commands. And also it's easier to automate. So, um, you know, what we do typically, we uh, just, you know, type some commands into, uh, into the command line. And it's, you know, it, it helps a lot to leverage this a little bit. Again, similar to the IDE, what really, really helps in the command line is to have aliases. So I think this is the biggest uh, advantage, especially is here if you're just starting out using the command line, because you might do something in a command line as a Java developer, like, you know, Maven clean install, right? Or for example, Maven uh, clean package, um, or, you know, doing uh, things like uh, git status or, you know, git push, git commit, and all these commands that we typically uh, type and use. But instead of doing this, it would actually be faster just to say, you know, maven clean install, which again, I expanded by a, something like a live template with a shell, shell alias, or, you know, just a maven package, for example, or maven clean package. Or actually, if we're honest, we do something like this, Maven package and skip the tests, right? This is what we're executing instead. So for that, you can also define a shortcut and then it's just faster and you don't have to type all of that all the time. Same for Git, instead of, um, you know, typing Git status all over again or um, Git push into um, origin and the current branch or uh, Git commit or what have you, or if you use, you know, Docker uh, to say you want to do a Docker build or a Docker push or, you know, Kubernetes to say, Kubernetes, give me all the pods, Kubernetes, give me all the services. And again, these are just examples that I use, but you will come up with different ones. And then it just so much faster to use the command line, right? We can continue the whole, uh, another hour for just like showing uh, which, you know, aliases we could use, curl, local host, all the things that we use constantly. So this is a big um, improvement to um, just use the command line as a tip. And I was actually blogging about this before. What you can do, you can have a look into um, your history, like a Z shell history or bash history, and then grab sort them, um, the lines that are there by, um, by usage. And then you will see the commands where it really makes sense to define aliases for because you type them um, all, all the time. Uh, then if, the, uh, so if you have questions specifically for that, we can talk a lot about it. It's just a question what you're most interested in. I think it makes some sense to think about, uh, uh shell shortcuts and especially the shell environment, uh, that we have as well. So I use uh, Z shell now, most of the time, uh, because of some features and most importantly, um, it really helps to navigate quickly. So typically you have seen something like, you know, colleagues who type cd dot dot, cd dot dot, and so on and so forth. But for changing directories, especially in your command line, you don't have to type cd for change directory. Uh, in C shell, you can just uh, do something like, um, for example, um, home directory, um, workspaces, you know, Sebastian Dashner, this project that I will show you in a second, and just um, hit a tab all the time to auto expand it. And you don't have to type cd, you can just switch. 
And another very nice thing and even more helpful is you can auto expand multiple hierarchies at once. So what I just did, you actually don't have to type, you know, uh, workspaces tab, you can just say, okay, a W O S D, you know, um, uh, Liberty something source main Java, and then hits tab once and it auto expands all of it. Um, and you just have to uh, hit enter and then you're already in this directory. And this is a really big um, improvement if you just want to navigate uh, quickly. And in the same way, there are some shortcuts that help you to uh, move around also a little bit faster. So for example, you probably know about this command. I can type it again, clear, which clears the current uh, window. But instead, there is also, um, you can hit Control L. And that does the same. So that is a default, right? And it's just faster because you don't have to, you know, type something and hit enter. You just basically make one movement, Control L, and then you're faster. Or I also defined a uh, uh, shortcut, Control K, which just shows the current directory. Um, let's go back here. If I say, you know, control K, then it lists the current file. So instead of saying, you know, clear and LS or something like that, it's just faster or LS um, uh, like this. It's just faster for me to type either an alias such as L or it's even faster to say control K and then it just displays what I have here. And some more, I, for example, have um, this tree um, uh, command that you might know. So tree, uh, show me the uh, next level of uh, hierarchies here. So it's almost like a file um, um, extension, like a file browser. And then you can do this Why I do this with control uh, J for one level or control H with two levels. And then you see now it's uh, too big of a font, but then you see the multiple hierarchies with just one keystroke. And it's really fast to navigate once you get used to all of these um, shortcuts. So that is very, very helpful and it will just maximize your command line usage. Okay, then, of uh, course, a couple of questions yeah. from, from the chat. Please. Yeah, so uh, Sebastian, do you know some customizable keyboards? Uh, for example, with the ability to map keyboard, uh, key to shortcut of action, etc. to use in console? Yes, very good question. And this is a very important one. Um, later on, I will um, uh, touch a little bit about Vim and where, you know, it's a setup where you use the escape key a lot. So what I do, I um, remap the escape key on an operating system to a uh, caps lock because who needs caps lock, right? And I just use escape for that. And um, even what I found out that on actually on this keyboard that I'm using right now, you can map even the keys on a keyboard level, which is really cool, which is on a hardware level. So you get some firmware and then just say, okay, use this key instead of that key. And then instead of reconfiguring your operating system, which on some systems is really hacky, like on Windows, it's, you, you know, you have to do some admin rights uh, registry hacking. Um, I, I've done that before, it works, but it's actually really nice uh, if you can switch the keyboard. So with that keyboard, you can do that. Um, you can just change the firmware and then literally send any key or even keystrokes, and it all happens on the hardware, which is really, really much, much easier. Um, if you don't have one of these on Linux, it's also very, not easy world, but it's very doable to um, change the keyboard layout. So I've done that uh, before because I, I use, um, you know, instead of escape um, on caps lock I use well I use escape and this helps a lot and then sometimes I think I also had one or two remappings uh, for other things usually I stay quite like uh, on the normal mode um, but this is very helpful so you can check out one of these that's the only one I know for now but uh, basically there, there should be many projects right like in if anything you can solder your own keyboard or you know change the uh, um, change the configuration of the chip, but this helps a lot, like especially with, with remapping something like escape. That's, that's really required. Yeah. Uh, okay. And there's a huge, huge discussion in the chat about, um, uh, that in, uh, IDE, like IntelliJ, it's hard to do mm -hmm. some things with, um, uh, shortcuts like running individual unit tests. So what should we do with this mm -hmm. and what should we do with unit tests? Like you can select it by yeah. keyboard, but you should uh, press crazy combinations and then select with arrows, etc. Yes, with the crazy combination. So um, yeah, it's 
if, if you if you have a scenario where you want to run different unit tests and different uh, test combinations then it can become a little bit tricky because what you can do you can say you know like run and then run uh, the last ones, if you say, yeah, like this, um, all, all shift F10, and then it will um, suggest a few of these, but also, you know, you might ha want to have more, or maybe, you know, you're switching more regularly. So this can help. Actually, I would just get used to at least the most important um, run uh, um, shortcuts, because that's actually really helpful. If you say, you know, what's a control shift F10, if you're in a test, um, we will cover unit tests also a little bit later. Um, I usually execute actually all of them. And I just make sure that all of the unit tests, at least on the code test level, really runs fast. So it doesn't matter. So I can say, you know, run hundreds of tests in a few milliseconds. If we are on plain J unit, this really works well. That's my approach to unit testing. I would say if you have a few run configurations, then probably at least I don't know any better way than just say, okay, um, have a few run configurations and then run them with, you know, control alt or what's that, uh, F10, I think, um, to just execute it in, in this way. But yeah, I don't know of another better way. Uh, you can also, I think, create some, I mean, run configurations, basically, I think all you have in, uh, for these actions. Other than that, if it's more complicated, like, you know, starting up multiple things or starting up a pipeline, I would actually write a script, like a shell script. Do we have some more questions about that or should we continue? Oh, well, let's continue. Okay. Um, so yes, about shell scripting, what I just mentioned, um, this is basically, you know, the, the natural thing to automate in the command line. And it's actually very, very easy to say, um, I want to automate how I build my application, for example, because you literally just type the same commands into uh, a file, make the executable and, you know, there you go. So for example, if we're, if I say in order to run, um, this project, I, um, let's go back here or let's go to a temp directory. Um, I need to, for example, do something like a maven clean package, right? And then afterwards I do a Docker build and then act afterwards I do a Docker push, uh, for example. So, you know, you're always performing the same steps or manually you're copying, uh, some jar, uh, jar or war file to a specific directory, right? And you're always executing the same steps. So, you know, all of these things that you do manually can be automated and, um, if you write a script, and this actually what I executed was also a script to create a script, um, just, uh, you know, paste it into a plain text file, I uh, have this bin bash uh, for a bash script um, a command, and then you can say, you know, something like maven clean package, and docker build, and now you have to type them uh, for once, docker build it, docker push it, or uh, docker run, for example, and so on and so forth, and then they will just be executed. You make this file executable um, and there you go. And this is, I would say, a very straightforward way just to automate on once you are in a, in a command line environment anyway, then you can just run these scripts and it will be much, much faster. So, you know, I try, there are many, many stories what to automate, but basically, especially on a Unix environment, you can automate everything. You can aut automate even, you don't see my cursor, but you can automate mouse movements, like where to move them uh, to, and then, you know, do something like Selenium uh, uh, testing, like clicking on some UI, or you can automate, you know, like which things you open every morning. So for example, I have even an automation, which browser tabs I typically uh, open or which, you know, like programs I open just because it's so much faster than, um, than doing these things manually. We really should automate as developers in order to be become more productive, right? Because you can just lean back and I don't know, surf, uh, uh, Facebook or uh, Vcontacte or um, Instagram or whatever, while your computer does the work for you. And now about this uh, Vim way of typing um, that I showed um, earlier, and actually uh, the reason why um, I use this Vim uh, editor that nobody knows uh, uh, how to exit. And actually let me start up um, another thing uh, that is just helpful sometimes. So what I have here, um, which is a key moni monitor where I say, okay, actually now you see which keys I'm pressing, um, because it might be helpful. So the confusing thing about the editor, and I don't want to give a big, uh, uh, introduction here. There are many tutorials, how to use Vim, but what I really like is not actually the editor. It's the keyboard concept, what you do, because per default, and this is the confusing part, you're in the normal mode. You cannot type if you do anything here. 
so nothing changes but you have to go one level deeper to a different layer to an insert mode where then you can type and the big advantage of that is in this mode you can actually use the same home row the same hand position where your fingers are already located to move around so now if i say go back or go um let's create some more lines go line up and down then you don't have to switch to the cursor and this uh, is really really fast because then just by changing these layers it really becomes a way of thinking even that i call the not only way of typing but way of thinking to say okay line up or word forward or word backwards and with the second thing that you can do uh, in vim which is composable commands you can compose your own commands uh, with some movement and some actual action so to say delete word forward to say okay now it deleted the whole word or delete um you know the whole line or delete line down like two lines there and you see delete is uh d for delete and then you can just you know combine these commands so let's say i join this line and then i go back and i want to delete a word forward or i want to delete two words forward and so on and so forth you really get into this once you climb this a uh, little bit steep learning curve it becomes really really fast to type and especially if you write a lot so i wrote um uh, my books in actually in, in vim in a plain text uh, markup which is really really a joy so you become so fast in uh, in using that and th there are also many tips and tricks out there how to get a little bit faster this is for example why i have this weird line numbering on the left uh, what you see here so this is a relative line numbering if i say i want to jump to this long line there which is six up in relation to where i am right now so i just say six up and then i'm there already or i say i want to join jump to the almost last line um and then i say eight down and then i'm there as well so you just very very fast in navigating and as you can see here i'm using the same in my ide so this is really really fast for me and once you get used to it you want to have it in every environment so now i do it even in you know in the command line so here i can just do the same and if i say well i have a long command and at the end instead of hitting backspace all the time what i can do i can say okay just you know jump here or word backward and so on and so forth it's just so much faster to navigate once you get used to it so this is why i'm a big fan of using this whim way of typing not because of the editor i use this as well but it's not the greatest editor actually but the way of typing is really really nice and yes do we have questions uh, for that uh not exactly for that but uh, three people in the chat uh, are asking you about two panel file, file managers uh, is there any better replacement for midnight commander or file manager and do you even use them actually i don't so i've i think i tried the i have to see if it's still there vimfm or something like that vim vifm something like this i think that's a file manager uh, as well but actually what i do i just use my command line so what i showed you before with uh, for example um uh, go to this uh, project um, and you know to this project that i showed you earlier and then you know do something like list current files uh, go to a different a subdirectory list files again and copy files and move files so for me actually this is a very very fast way to navigate and i almost never use anything else like if for example i have to rename um, multiple files at once i do something like um, i don't know um, ls and then x arc to say okay you know take all of the files here and then you know rename them in a specific pattern uh, or something like that for me that's just faster than uh, using using a um, file explorer so i know there are some out there uh, also for the command line also that you know have the vim kind of key mapping uh, but i i really don't um, i still have a gui file manager installed if i really really need it but usually um i don't uh, for opening files which is helpful um as well in z shell you can have suffix aliases uh, so for example if i say um uh, i go to a specific let's see if i have a file where it makes sense if i go to a specific uh file like a uh like a zip file oh yeah let's create one um if i say you know i zip this into zip.zip .zip, uh the palm xml and the readme and now i just created um, a zip file and then i can say instead of saying unzip dash l to list the contents of the zip file i can also say just zip zip file directory because i i installed a suffix for um 
dot zip that then I can instruct the shell okay if you get this as a command which is actually a file then please execute in this case unzip dash l and which uh, lists us just the current uh, directory um, you can do the same with jar files or you know with anything with pdf then you say okay please open the I don't know if I have a PDF right now. Um, you uh, open the correct program with uh, PNGs, you know, open it here and there and so on and so forth. So this is really uh, uh, helpful there um, as well. So if I, oh, wait a second, I can show this. If I go to example, a web, my web page, this is images, I think. Yeah, I can just have some, some in, uh, image. Uh, what I have here, and then it just shows some some image that I created on my website before. So because it opened the correct program, and by doing that, I can just navigate in my files, and I really don't have to use a file uh, explorer anymore. So that's what I'm using. Uh, okay, another little question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Andre asks: Productivity is also about reading code. What fonts do you mm -hmm. recommend, and what do you think about ligatures? Yes, um, which fonts? So for now, I, I used a few fonts. For now, I'm using the official JetBrains uh, font, like the JetBrains Mono, which is installed right now, JetBrains Mono, I think, uh, with IntelliJ. So with the latest IntelliJ version, you have this in your IDE, but also I installed it on my command line. So this is now my default Mono font, just because I, I, I really like it and to uh, how it reads. So the readability is just great. Well, I don't use uh, ligature for those uh, for those uh, who ask where are they here. Um, so I always have the ligatures off. I don't know why. For me, it just it's confusing. If I even if I read Java code for so many times, if I see this, I was like, what is that operator? What is this? You know, like. Uh, you don't see my cursor. Uh, what is this top left uh, element here until I say, oh, it's the greater and uh, less than a uh, sign. So a uh, ligature just for some reason just confused me. I always turn them off. Um, here, I think, yeah, that is a nice thing to say, okay, to, to change the balance for readability. But for me, for some reason, if just, you know, something like arrows are connected, then which I don't expect in the code, I think you can get used to it quite quickly. But Actually, for me, it was always easier to say, okay, I don't, uh, for some reason, but that's just me. I, you know, whatever works for you best. Um, the nice thing about that is it's really subjective. So you install it on your system and you, you know, you don't disturb your uh, coworkers if you change something there, which is good. Um, I personally uh, use this font without uh, ligatures in my command line and in my IDE. So uh, everywhere, actually. Okay, let's continue. All right. Perfect. So also in the editor, so I use Vim, but again, that's just an example. Whatever editor you do, you can have something. I now call them live templates again. Sometimes they're called snippets or, you know, expand something in order just to write faster. So if I go to my Vim, I actually, believe it or not, I'm writing my, um, my emails in Vim as well. Why? Because it's just so much faster. If I say, okay, uh, dear um, sir or madam, tap to expand, right? And then I say, hello world, um, best regards, Sebastian. And then, you know, take this and copy paste and put it into your um, a browser, into your email program and send it. It's so much faster for me than just um, type that, right? Or things I type all the time. So for example, if I say, well, I work as a, a developer advocate, right? And uh, even small things like, um, IBM and then it will be uppercase and my name is Sebastian Dashner and you know things that I always keep typing it's actually faster to just create something like a live template in um, your favorite editor as well so this is really really a big improvement uh, forever uh, for whatever you keep typing all the time and then you can get really really fast uh, in typing with uh, with no um, you know, like no much, not much effort, especially if, you know, you write a book or you write blogs or you write often in general and, you know, things like that, even if some managers are watching, or I don't know if they would watch my talks or why, but it really makes sense to automate in general. If you're not even, not even a developer, I don't know if you, somebody uh, then would watch, um, you can automate things in your browser as well. There are browser extensions to say, you know, what am I typing all the time into my email program? So not even signatures, but, you know, parts of sentences that you keep typing all over, you can just automate them. And this really, really helps uh, to become more productive in general, especially on also in your uh, your editor, or, you know, like, even something, um, not only live templates that you that are always the same, but something like, you know, the current date, 
it's so much faster to type this or to type it in a German format or, you know, like to say, oh, please give me the, uh, uh, the, the time or a Unix timestamp or a UUID, which is randomly generated. It's just faster to, uh, to do this um, as a shortcut or a, t a template that then also goes into, a, I think it executes a shell um, command under the hood and just replace this in your editor, which is really cool. So that's just for me, the, uh, a very important part of automation as well. All right, now for the second uh, uh, part of these uh, 20 tips. Um, what I really advise, especially for Java developers, for the modern technologies we have, is to use some kind of hot reload mechanism when coding. So this is now going back a little bit to the topic of coding again. And especially in Java, you may have heard of this uh, Quarkus technology where I gave a presentation uh, in the past and uh, or some technologies such as Open Liberty um, or um, also Spring with Spring DevTools has hot um, reload mechanisms, something similar to JRebel, where you just say you have a deployment or an, um, process which is up and running and you just change uh, your deployment based on the code um, uh, that you're executing. So let's close them again. And I go back to this uh, project, which is um, a Liberty, an Open Liberty uh, project that I will actually um, package Liberty Dev that I will run now in a specific mode. So what this is, this is a Java enterprise application that comes with some, you know, Jakarta EE8 and uh, is deployed to Open Liberty in my case. And what I use, I use a plugin. So this is just one example um, that implements this, that will run a Liberty locally and watch and listen for file changes. So once that is up and running and deployed, then I can say, okay, locally now, I just move this out of the way. Uh, I can say, you know, curl local host 9080, you saw again, shell, uh, shell shortcut. Um, uh, go to, I think it's called uh, hello greetings hello or something like that, which is my hello world application. And then it just says, hello. Okay. No surprise here, but then I can change this. Um, if I say, well, you've probably have seen, um, um, something like that. If I um, change it to hello exclamation mark, if I look into it, it very quickly reloads my application. And then it says, well, hello, um, exclamation mark here as well. And again, this is the running application. So this is actually an application where I then can test something in an end-to-end -end fashion as well, right? It's not just a unit test or a code level where I can re-execute the unit test. It's really something that very quickly gives me um, the ability to see uh, whether my application will work later on once it is deployed. So, you know, in a more production-like uh, setting with the running application. Um, if you know about Quarkus, this implements the same. And this is just very, very important to basically keep in that flow experience because waiting times as developers, waiting times are really bad, right? Because what happens if you say you want to write some code, for example, you change hello um, question mark to hello um, exclamation mark. And now if I need to go and say, okay, Maven clean package, Docker build, Docker run, or wait half an hour or a few minutes to redeploy it, well, then of course I get bored, right? I take uh, my smartphone or I check my emails and then say, okay, um, I get distracted, I'm out of my flow experience. And this is, you know, really bad for the productivity. And it's also not fun because I don't want to wait. I want to get the feedback right now. I want instant gratification, instant feedback to see, okay, did it work? Um, hello, question mark, did I yeah, change it? And then it says, hello, exclamation mark. I don't have to wait. So this is really crucial uh, for that. And also about your whole development um, workflow, you should keep the turnaround cycle short, including your testing. So what I just did, it was one Hello World example that just deploys something locally, but the same can be extended to your whole local test setup or whatever test setup you have. So you should not wait for longer than just a very few seconds in order to get the constant feedback, at least while developing. If you finish the feature and then, then you know, it takes half an hour, you go to lunch, that's a different story. But if you have to go to lunch or grab a coffee every five minutes, then you know, you, you won't be productive. You drink a lot of coffee, but that's also not healthy uh, every five minutes. So you need to, you know, do something differently. Um, and in my case, what, uh, what I use, um, so this, 
together with some tests. Uh, if you say, okay, for example, I have a unit test that now just say, okay, is equal, so this is boring. Um, but also in something like a, a system test, like an I, um, integration test that tests whether my deployed application is actually uh, correct. So what this um, Liberty plugin also allows you, and this is really nice, once you hit enter, it runs your unit tests. And if they pass, it also runs the Maven integration tests, which are part of the default Maven um, uh, workflow. And now it says, oh, actually, you know, it failed because it's uh, hello uh, and not hello exclamation mark. And this is good. This is immediate feedback, right? I can run it again. It was really, really fast to say, okay, I changed my code, run the test. Oh, it didn't work. So what I do, of course, well, you know, say something like uh, test disabled, right? <laughs> or <laughs> better yet, fix the test. Um, I say, okay, this should actually be um, um, exclamation mark, hello, exclamation mark. And then what I can do, I can run the unit tests again, and then it says, okay, now they're green. And then immediately it actually runs my integration tests. So what it means, it reloaded my application so that it says, hello, exclamation mark. And it immediately connects to this running application locally as well. And this is what I want to not wait, right? I don't want to wait for server restart like 10 seconds or longer. I want to get it immediately. And this uh, now is a different test that is now failing because, well, it says, you know, hello, instead of hello exclamation mark. So let's fix this test as well. And then I rerun the unit tests they're passing. And then I rerun uh, the integration tests they're also now passing. And now it's done, right? It's really fast feedback and that is important. Um, what is also included there, which is quite cool, it includes the configuration. So if I have a configuration that comes from some, uh, something like a config file, and if I go to, I think it's called uh, config, it says, uh, hey, or uh, hey, question mark, and then I can um, change this here as well, which is also part of my system test. So then, you know, I have to change the config again. Um, or see so that my system test is not uh, failing for the second use case. And this can be integrated into a whole local test setup where you say you start up your components, including a database, maybe an external system or some mock server locally. And then you just um, have to make sure that you get the fast uh, feedback. So you really don't have to wait while developing. Right, because otherwise it's it's not fun. If I change something and then I don't know locally quickly why that works, well, I then I go uh, say git push, and then you know the CI/CD server breaks, and my uh, colleague is angry and says, "Nie robota yet," and you know then I then I'm I'm uh, I'm the bad guy who just like uh, pushed something that wasn't tested. So you need to get a short turnaround cycle locally to see whether it's working. And together with that, so this covers also the topic that you want fast feedback test scenarios. So this is what I uh, mentioned with you don't, uh, you should not wait. So in my tests, I actually don't use something like spring context tests or um, uh, test containers or something that starts up the test all the time. So my integration test, you see it's a plain J unit test without any test runner. And it uses um, here a helper class that just uh, well connects to my uh, running application as a client, and then it just immediately says, okay, give me the status. So I don't, I'm not tangling the test lifecycle with the test environment lifecycle. I started up my um, my application or my system using shell scripts or using something else here in the command line separately, which I run uh, here. And then my tests just connect against, against something that is already running. And this is why the test, I can also run it from my uh, command line here why the tests are running really, really uh, quickly and just connect uh, to the system that is already running. Well, now I said quickly, actually my IDE had to rebuild it. So that's why uh, sometimes in the command line it's even faster. But once, oh God, I think I changed the dependencies now, uh, but once it is running um, in the IDE, it's actually really fast because it does not need to start up something and it just runs very quickly. So this is really important in order to stay productive, um, especially while developing locally doesn't matter which technology you use. So here I showed Open Liberty with, uh, with this mode. I really like the plugin. It's a very nice you know, experience, especially that it runs the test. That's really fast. Um, but with anything um, um, that you use, you know, you can build up your own uh, hot reload uh, mechanism, even IntelliJ with the debug mode, then you can rebuild and then it tries to swap the classes. Does not always work, but you know, if it works, it's just so much faster than um, restarting all over again, at least while developing. 
end about the topic of uh, automation. Of course, if you take uh, the idea how I deploy my software and how I ship the whole thing to the users further, then you end up with something like uh, continuous delivery, which is just automation again, automating all of this process and building the quality in of having automated test suites. And of course, all of the automation steps, so no manual work required, how to go to production, right? So build my project, you know, Maven package, Docker build, and then push it somewhere, deploy it to Kubernetes or to some other environment, run the system tests against this environment, maybe go to another staging environment and automate all of these steps in the pipeline so it becomes really quickly and really reliably because it's so much better than if I do it as a human, I, you know, I get bored, I get tired, I make mistakes, but the automation runs much faster and uh, much, with much more predictable uh, quality. All right, do we have some uh, questions for now for um, all of these topics? Uh, yeah, I have a few. Yeah, Denis asks, mm -hmm. uh, is it, was it unit tests or was it uh, CI, CD tests that are connected to a cluster or something like that? Um, yes, actually, I did use uh, the unit test right now. So what you saw was both unit te uh, code level tests and also uh, system tests or integration tests um, that connect against my system. But what I did was just locally. So then what you do in a CI CD pipeline is to say, okay, you use the same, you should use the same test code and you know, the same uh, scenarios. But then I usually have something like a config here, where I stay, uh, stay, um, um, instead of going to this URI, go to, you know, not localhost, but then, you know, the IP of your test uh, system or something like that, and then run the same tests against the actual scenario. Plus, of course, all of your business use cases and, you know, like create order, create coffee uh, or customer or whatever. And um, then you can verify this as well. Um, this also helps if you just run your test in a very basic way without uh, bundling the environment in the test uh, case in the Java code together, because then you can separate it and say, okay, run it with a different config. Now it goes against my CI CD environment or something like that. So a very good question here. Does it make sense to use the second screen to run all your tests, etc., and monitoring? It depends how you have your setup. So actually I always always use one screen. Um, I um, So this is a full HD um, uh, setup, what you see right now. The monitor I um, usually use is a little bit bigger. Um, so I have like a split screen setup, but this is more what, you, um, what you're using. So for example, um, usually I have, um, I use i3, like i3 uh, window manager on uh, Linux. Why? It's a tiling window, man uh, window manager. And I can say, okay, um, echo hello here, echo hi there. And then, you know, I can, fire up different uh, uh, things. And then I just, you know, can look at to my log files on the left side and here I can do something else. So for me, it was actually always faster to have everything in one screen and just navigate quickly or then change, you know, like a change here, change back by a, a keyboard shortcut rather than having a second screen, All right? So for me, it's easier actually to have just one focus area and then switch quickly via keyboard rather than, you know, like lo looking around somewhere, but whatever works for you. So I'm very happy actually with one setup, uh, with one monitor, it also makes it easier for some video setups for me. Uh, but you know, whatever you're happy with, I would say. Okay. Uh, do you use some, uh, ideas or other tools in browser and world about productivity in browser? something like Vimium or other things. Yes. So what I'm using, I think originally I was using Vimium. Now I'm using, I think it's uh, called surfing keys. So what it does, if you, uh, I hope you can see it. These are small dots. Um, you can actually use your browser only with your keyboard. So, you know, it, it kind of works. Sometimes you really need a mouse, but uh, for if you just have some, um, if you want to just look up uh, some things, for example, if I go to my blog and then I say, okay, take the first um, uh, article. So I just highlighted what you maybe uh, saw, just one link by pressing F and then it shows me some overlay, uh, which I can uh, nicely see on the, um, nicely have on the home row as well. So it's a little bit, you know, like um, faster. What also is actually helpful, you don't see my uh, cursor, unfortunately, but I uh, can actually scroll and use the mouse with this uh, uh, keyboard that I'm using. 
So uh, it, it has actually, maybe you see it here, it actually has a mouse emulation via one key. So I can at least, you know, like do something like uh, scroll uh, up and down. This is now also with my keyboard. Um, and you can do like some things. It really depends whether, uh, whether it makes sense. Uh, what I use is surfing keys uh, on, on Chromium, uh, what I have here. But um, well, with the keyboard, I, I got asked this question a few times, whether it makes sense to really uh, only use the keyboard for everything, uh, like in the browser. I would say it's about the set of uh, like, whether you have a limited set of actions, right? So if you're typing or if you're hitting some shortcuts, you only have so and so many, right? You don't have a million, you maybe have a few dozens or a few hundreds of things where it's faster to say, okay, you have multiple keys available. But if you go to a website, you don't know how the website looks before, right? So um, you really have to see, okay, how can I, uh, what uh, menu do I have here on the top and this and that. You don't know upfront how it looks like it, then it makes more sense to exploratory, go around and use a mouse or something like that. But what I really would um, try to focus on is to eliminate the number of switches or to reduce the number of switches, right? Because every time you have to switch for and back to your mouse and your keyboard or to your touchpad and things like that, this will slow you down. So the more you can time you can spend on one device, even if it's only the, the mouse, uh, you know, as a designer, for example, or uh, only the keyboard will just usually make you a little bit faster. You can um, experiment a little bit with browser setups. It will get you, it will get you a little bit faster. As the very least, what you can do is to have the uh, the shortcuts like switching tabs, for example, or then you know like closing tab um, or uh, opening tab again. Also, this keyboard actually has some some hotkeys for that as well, uh, just for the browser movement, which is just faster if in you know you use the mouse in one hand and the other hand for the keyboard. Uh, then you know you have something like both. <laughs> All right, do you have some more questions? I think let's continue. Okay. So what I also, and this is a little bit less uh, connected to code, um, want to have a few more topics on, well, how you manage, um, well, a few things, for example, configuration management. So what we probably know as infrastructure as code can, I would say, be extended to something like everything is code. So what does that mean? If you think of um, Docker or Kubernetes, what we have in our project is having something like a Docker file, which is infrastructure as code, right? So we specify as code how, in this case, our application should look like, right? So this is like install this, open Liberty runtime, then, you know, like copy the configuration and then copy my deployment, my Java code, and, you know, all of the steps that we need to do. And then I don't have to do it manually. I don't have to log in. I don't have to execute the steps. The automation will do it for me. The same with um, these Kubernetes uh, YAML files, right? So I don't have to uh, specify how my environment looks like. Um, um, in manual steps, I do it via this declarative approach, and then I just throw it against the technology and it will automate it for me. Good thing is I can write this in code, I can store it under version control, I can automate and so on and so forth. The same is true for other things, for example, documentation. So you can write um, ASCII doc or Markdown, for example, as a plain text uh, documentation format. And then as you know, something like this, like a readme, and then you can say, okay, actually, you can process this further. You can store it under version control. You can uh, process it to a nice HTML website or a PDF or something like that. But the source is as code. And, you know, this is where you track it. The same with installation scripts. So I, I track an installation of my laptop um, as a you know, shell script as well. And then if I get a new laptop, I don't have to reinstall everything manually. It just takes half an hour or 15 minutes to install everything from scratch by just running, you know, all of the installation steps, especially if you're on Linux. And this is what I mean with everything as code that you literally can try to store everything that you create as a developer, where it's effort to create like code, like documentation, like um, infrastructure setup, like um, some installation as code and store it on a version control and then just make the, let the automation work for you. So I think that's a, um, that's a nice uh, thing to follow as well. <laughs> And now a little bit more on less about uh, developers, but more about humans. So what is really, really important um, in order to work effectively is to, well, trying to be able to focus. 
and distractions in any ways are really, really bad. So this device is really this is one of the worst inventions in human productivity, uh, like your smartphone with all of the notifications that you have or browser notifications uh, like a mail uh, or Slack, really, really bad for productivity because you know you get a lot of distractions. Now, most of us or almost all of us are working from home in this uh, situation. So there are less distractions by, you know, coworkers popping by your desk, but um, still in order to focus, well, we need to focus on one task at a hand without making these mental context switches. And this is really important. So what I do, and you saw my uh, setup here. So this is not a presentation mode. This is an usual setup uh, with, um, um, you know, here, all of the, you don't see a taskbar or actually there's just a very tiny taskbar on, on, on the bottom here, which I can uh, expand as well. Um, that's it. I don't have any notifications. There's no uh, operating system update or anything. No email program open, no Slack open. This really, you know, helps you to focus because just trying to kill all of the uh, distractions and all of the notifications. And then deliberately afterwards, after working for half an hour or an hour on what you want to focus on, you know, turn them on again, we uh, reply to these super important emails, and then continue with your work. It really helps to um, just focus on what you should focus on. Another thing uh, about, you know, knowledge work that helps you um, become uh, more effective and more productive, actually, is to, well, read the documentation and really know what you're doing. This sounds obvious, but I really, really mean it because if you use some technology where you just, you know, like copy and paste, try and error, stack overflow around, and you did not really understand what you're doing, it really will make you less effective because, you know, the computer doesn't care. If you did not type the statement in a correct way, you can type it a thousand times, the computer, you know, will not do it. And many times it's about understanding the underlying concepts. So for example, you know, if you use things like Docker or Kubernetes, you should understand what a service is or what a deployment is or what are the concepts behind this. And it will make you more uh, effective in using it because, you know, you become more knowledgeable and, um, you know, documentation can have many forums. So even, you know, reading books and, you know, trying to educate yourself, um, trying to watch some video courses or conference presentations like this really will make you more uh, effective as a developer because you will become more knowledgeable. And in the same way, you should write some documentation. Yes, I know uh, most developers really don't like to write documentation like we don't like to write tests. So it's like the same category, but it will help you not only to be nice for your coworkers, but also for yourself. Because if you, know, if you work on some um, problem and then it's sad that code that you write after six months after half a year looks like some like somebody else's code like somebody else wrote the code and it's not even your code because you don't remember and i think this is not true i think this is the case even after two weeks for me if i look at code i wrote two weeks ago i have no clue what i did or even why so think of documentation as you write something for yourself that you create for yourself not explain what you did because you see it in the code but explain why you did it so why did we choose this technology? Why am I using this approach? Why can't we do it in the other way? All of the um, decisions that you made, trying to document them um, just for yourself. Write documentation as if you would write it for yourself. Um, for example, with, with many things I create, like you know my book or my blog, I always write my blog like I would write it for myself. Like, what did I learn today? And actually, many times I already had to use it in the future where I was Googling for some solution and I ended up on my own blog with, oh yes, I wrote this two years ago, that's right. And you know, it really helps you yourself as well. And that's, it will make you pr uh, more productive. Um, especially teaching is also a great way of, of learning. And if you write documentation, this is a form of teaching because you write it down and explain it for as if it was uh, were somebody else. Yes, so do we have some, some questions already on these extra uh, topics, uh, Oljek? Uh, actually, uh, people were trying to discuss uh, something about frameworks. So you talked about okay. fast feedback awesome. group, fast feedback yeah. group, and you presented us an open liberty, etc. And you're definitely lucky if you use open liberty, but sometimes you have to use other tech. 
uh, what you just have yes. to. Uh, so, and what do you think about living with something like Micronaut or Quarkus in, especially in native image mode when uh, everything shift to, to uh, runtime, fast runtime, but uh, compilation time sometimes is in, insanely slow. Yes, so there are many important points that you just covered. That's very a very good topic. Um, yes, um, I'm not 100% sure with Micronaut. I think it also supports a development mode, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm not quite sure, but it, with first of all, with most of the technology, you can you know get your way around locally by doing something like a debug mode of IntelliJ that can hot swap some classes um, and things like that. So I've done that for JavaFX projects and for some other things where it works. Um, Quarkus has a really good uh, development uh, mode as well. So it does a similar thing, you know, like Liberty, where it just very quickly uh, redeploys. And once you deploy something, especially with something like a, the native image in Quarkus, yes, this takes a long time. So first of all, deployment always takes longer than doing things locally, but especially with the Graal VM native image is really, really, you know, it takes minutes to even uh, create one, even on a fast machine. And this is, well, that's sp very specific to Quarkus, but this is one of the reasons why I mostly use Quarkus actually in JVM mode, even in production, because, you know, there's some other reasons like a throughput is also a different story. Once you have a JVM with, uh, with hotspot or with a, a JIT that then runs for longer than just a few minutes, um, then things also look differently again. Um, but that's specific to Quarkus. Um, when you are in a scenario where you have to test something that is deployed, so where you cannot test locally because of some integration of some external things, because of some login, then what you can do, there are some ways to get on a test environment to get into the cluster, for example, uh, things there is uh, what is called uh, telepresence. Uh, which is, um, you know, like a two-way proxy into um, your Kubernetes cluster where you can swap a process with your local machine. And then in your local machine, locally, you can debug and you're basically debugging something in a cluster. And this makes you, this is really nice because then you have the fast feedback loop as well. So you can uh, look into things like that where you have to have it for testing reasons. Um, in general, what I would say, regardless of the technology, whatever you do, you should have something that you can test as much as possible locally, where, you know, because that's just the easiest and the fastest. Um, and then if you sometimes have to test something that is part of a pipeline, try to use um, workarounds like this, um, or, you know, where you can quickly swap something in, uh, in a deployed cluster as well, because otherwise you will just take too, it will take too long uh, to, uh, to do this, uh, regardless of the technology. So, yeah. Uh, okay, and people uh, asking, uh, what is your tools uh, tool set and approach for writing documentation? And uh, Markdown, JavaDoc, ASCII-Doc, etc. Um, it really depends. If you have something that is uh, well suited for um, code, like for methods, JavaDoc is really nice because then you know if you're coding that you see the documentation, but it's just something for that is a more a technical documentation of a specific class or a specific method for um, some uh, like a documentation, documenting the, the reason, the motivation. Um, I usually use ASCII doc, but that's just me because I like, uh, well, I like the format. It has some advantages over, uh, over markdown, but in general, uh, just a plain text documentation that if it's technical, I store it under version control as well. So it's in the same repository, like your project that, that is actually, I think really good approach because then it's always in sync. Um, you see it immediately as a developer, um, you can, you know, uh, commit uh, some changes uh, to Git and, you know, you see all of the commits there. This is what I usually use. Um, yes, I, I always type in ASCII doc. So usually ASCII doc um, as part of the project as well. Uh, okay. We have only three minutes as far as I understand. Yes, so I will cover so, the, the last points yeah. quickly. Yeah. And then we have the Q&A area as well. And I think then we can cover the rest because it's a very nice uh, um, discussion. So I like questions and then we can cover some more if you join us in the uh, Q&A area. Because one thing is also really important and then we saw in the automation part already is to once in a while take a step back and reflect what you're doing. Especially look if there are many things that you keep doing all the time, right? Like, and 
it can be anything like live templates you you type if i type at inject all the time manually then i say okay wait a second i can have um, a live template for it or if um, i type this uh, git status or you know uh, maven clean package all the time then just see okay can i define a template for it can i define a shell script can i define some automation or you know are there even some tasks i always do manually it can be you know many many things so i created a lot of like hacky scripts that just do things faster than i could do them myself um then you know if you take this uh, step back if you take the time and see okay is there a better way around to do whatever you do as part of your um your job and this can be you know big things like huge scripts or even writing some program that does um, some automation or small things like just an alias or a, um, a live template or a shortcut like learning a shortcut as well it will make you more productive uh, over time and as the last thing and last tip i want to give you that we should always keep learning and especially now, and with now, I mean this current uh, pandemic situation where most of us have much more time where we're stuck at some place or at home um, that we can just use well in order to learn new skills, right? Like there are many great books out there, many video courses. You can watch uh, some uh, presentations or some recording of uh, presentations that will just make you more productive because you become more knowledgeable. It's like reading documentation, but on steroids, you learn from the experience of what other people uh, learned uh, or had to learn uh, before you. And this really, really will make you more productive and make a huge impact once you keep writing uh, code as well. And I think it's also really, really fun to learn once you discover that you did learn something. If you compare yourself with the code you wrote uh, two years ago, and then you see, oh, wow, you really improved. And I think that's a great feeling and that ultimately will make us more effective. And with all of these uh, tips and uh, steps uh, combined will also make our job more enjoyable because we are more effective and then we can spend uh, some time, you know, like on, uh, on other things that we also enjoy. So that's um, all I have for now. Um, all right. Спасибо большое for now for listening. <laughs> um, if you follow the first link, you see some uh, resources uh, there. I uh, also have a podcast that you can uh, listen to and many resources that you can check out. All right. Thank you, Sebastian. We kind of out of limit of our time. Thank you very much, Alec, for asking questions. Thank you for asking so many questions. See you there.